Hello, my name is Josh Martin, and this is my research project for EDFD 5043 with Dr. Jeff Longing. My topic of research is interactive video conferencing. Interactive video conferencing is defined as the holding of meetings in which the participants are in different places but are connected by audio and video links. Interactive video conferencing can be found in several fields, including business, government, military, broadcasting, and the field in which we will be focusing on in this presentation, education. Before we look at how video conferencing affects the field of education, we must look at where this technology originates from. Although it may seem like a technology that is relatively new, it was originally introduced at the World Fair in New York in the year of 1964. The first video conferencing technology was Bell's Picture Phone. After the introduction of Bell's Picture Phone in 1964, the next advancements in video conferencing came in 1976 with the Network Video Protocol and then in 1981 with the Packet Video Protocol. However, with the significant cost associated with these technologies, they were only used in labs and for private corporate use. As technology advanced, video conferencing was able to come to the commercial market. However, it still was not cheap by any means. In 1982, Compression Labs brought their video conferencing system onto the market at $250,000. It cost about $1,000 an hour to use the system. Technology continued to advance and PictureTel was able to bring their product in 1986, lowering the price to $80,000 for their system and about $100 an hour for use. As technology continued, IBM was able to create a PC-based system. It was $20,000 and about $30 an hour per use. Over the next six years, more companies found their way into the video conferencing market. In 1994, Apple Macintosh discovered their CUCME system. In 1996, Microsoft answered this by introducing the NetMeeting system. And in 1997, Caltech introduced the Virtual Room video conferencing system. In 2003, video conferencing reached a new height of commercial development. High-speed internet is a bit more available and affordable. The cost of video capture and display is decreased, and the availability of free video conferencing software was introduced onto the market. With commercial development making video conferencing more affordable, in 2003, schools around the world began integrating video conferencing into their distance learning programs. In the beginning, this was primarily used at universities. Next, we will look at the educational use of video conferencing in both the classroom and the home. One example of video conferencing in the classroom is conferences with experts on the topic that the class is studying. This is similar to a field trip and could make the topic more exciting for students. Another example is live streaming with classrooms in other parts of the nation or the world. This will expand their cultural uh, boundaries and also show them how students elsewhere are learning about topics. On this slide, I have included the Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration website. Here they have links for video conferences featuring professional development, links for video conferencing presentations to be used in the classroom, and it also features a way for teachers to connect with each other and set up video conferencing between their classes. On this slide, I have included an example of how I could use video conferencing in my band hall to help students meet content standard 11 of the fine arts framework. By having the class live stream via Skype with a college professor who teaches music tech and have them discuss current technologies, 
I can help them learn to describe technologies and influences on music. Next, we will discuss video conferencing at home and how it can be used by the student and the family. The student can use technologies such as Skype for group work with other students. They can also use it to obtain individual instruction. I've used Skype in the past with students that could not make it to the band hall during the summer for a music lesson. Video conferencing can also be utilized by the student's family for a multitude of reasons. Let's say the child has a field trip to the zoo and the parent wants to experience that with them, or share that experience in a way that they can discuss it when the child gets home from school. It can also be utilized to live stream certain events that the family may or may not be able to make. Let's say the student has a basketball game and his family from out of state wants to see it. Let's say the student has a concert for choir or band and uh, once again, the family cannot make it to that concert. This will give them a chance to see that event. Also, it could work at graduation for out-of-state family members that want to witness their child uh, graduating from a grade or high school. It could also be used for conferences in the case that the parent couldn't make it to the school at the scheduled time. It would give them a chance to meet with the teacher via video conference. Skype and Google Hangouts are two of the most common types of video conferencing software. In the next slide, I've included a video showing just how easy it is to use the Google Hangouts website to set up a video conferencing session. Okay, hey there. I wanted to show you how you can set up and run a Google Hangout. So the first thing that you need to make sure that you have is a Google Plus account associated with your Gmail and that's the easiest way so just make sure that you have a Gmail account and once you're in your Gmail just go ahead and click here and click on Google Plus so you need to initiate the hangout from Google Plus so I'm just gonna it's always asking you to do something manage my page okay so once you're in here then over here under dashboard you can come over here under hangouts and once you are in a hangout then uh, on the hangouts page I mean then um, is where you get started now there's two things that you can do you can start a hangout right away and you can schedule it now the important thing is that you have two audiences for your hangout the first one is the people who are going to be watching the hangout and not participants meaning they won't be on camera at the bottom of the hangout and then there are the participants now when you start a hangout if you schedule it it's going to give you a link now you can send out that link to anybody and that is a viewer link so that's when you when you schedule it you don't actually get a participant link meaning somebody who's going to show up until you actually start the hangout so let's just walk through that for a minute so when you come in here you, after you clicked on hangouts come over here to start a hangout on air and you're going to give it a name and I'm just going to say test um, how about let's do um, show starting hangout okay now I'm going to do one that starts later so let's say I'm doing one Right now it's 619 and I'm going to say it starts at 630. So I'm going to go ahead and click here on um, here on later and we'll do a 630 a.m. And you can set your duration here. Now your audience is public and I would just leave it at that because remember that when you are setting this up, it is a public hangout and it's going to give you a link. So I'm just going to go ahead and click here on share. Now it's going to go ahead and on your Google Plus page, it's going to show you your Hangout. Now here, okay, now a couple of things. When you are on your um, Hangout page, notice that right over here, there's something called Links. And if you click on Links, then your event page is right here. So let's say that you set this up for later tonight and you want to invite people to the Hangout and give them the link. You'll send that event page link out and that's going to allow them to come and view your Hangout at the time that it starts. 
if they come before that, they're just going to get this page that says the Hangout has not started yet. All right, so that's the event page, and that's the link that you send out and say, hey, I'm having a Hangout at 6.30. Here's the link. Please come and join us. Okay, now you don't do anything with the participants at this, I mean, the people, the panelists at this point, because it's just set up and waiting. So you go ahead and send out that link to people so they know where to join you. Now, once you start your Hangout, I'm going to go ahead and click on Start. Then you go ahead and you'll see here that when you do this, it's going to ask you to invite guests. Now, these guests are the people that you want to invite via email. So I'm going to go ahead and put in my other email address. Okay, and it's going to say send an email to sewart9254 at gmail.com. And then I can add more people. Now remember that these are your participants, okay? And your Hangout is connected to your Google Plus page and it's going to be broadcasted on there and on my YouTube account. And then I just click on Invite. Okay, I'm going to turn the camera off. All right, so now I have the Hangout is um, getting started. Now, what has happened now is that uh, SUR9254 has been sent a link. You'll see here at the bottom of the Hangout, it says off air. Okay, so the email has gone out and um, to the people that you want to have on the panel. So when you did that invite, it'll send them a link. They can click on that link and they'll start to join you over here. And then once you're ready, you'll do a start broadcast. So that's going to be what starts the broadcast, what enables the, anybody on your Google Plus page, which is over here, and anybody who has that direct link that you did when you first set it up um, can access the viewer Hangout. And then um, once you're done, then you go ahead and click on Stop Broadcast, and it will save it directly to your YouTube channel that you have set up with associated with your email account. Okay, just a couple other things to note. You can set up a chat so that people can participate in the chat. That's a new feature here on Google+. This is how you do a screen share. You just click on that, and I suggest that you do a um, desktop screen share. And that's the easiest way to, um, to get that going. The other thing here is the uh, toolbox. And here on the toolbox, this is where you can set your name. So I would want to put my name here, something like, um, Scott Ewart, and then whatever you want your tagline to be, um, the traffic guy, something like that. Okay, and then just turn that on, and that will get your um, your name um, in that bar underneath. And you can um, use that then to identify all the participants. So make sure that if you're running the Hangout that you have your participants um, setting that up to do that. Okay. So just to recap, you can set up a Google Hangout in advance or to start right now. When you first set it up, the link that it gives you is what you set to participants. When you come in here under your Google Plus page and click start, then that's when you send out the, you invite people to actually be participants and they'll get a separate link in their email to click on to join you as a participant. And then once you're in, you do a start broadcast and that will um, get you going. Okay, so if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me and I will talk to you later. Bye bye. In my band hall, I plan on my class video conferencing with professional musicians and others to connect them to the world of music. It's my hope that this will broaden their cultural and musical horizons, fostering an interest in the acquisition of musical ability and making band even more exciting for them. Thank you for watching. I hope my research has shown how interactive video conferencing will extend the walls of our classrooms, giving students a multitude of new educational experiences.